We went live a little bit early, so it'll be quick. We'll see if people come on. But yeah, so John, how how are you two connected? How long have you guys worked together and how how'd you guys get connected? Um, we actually got connected because I was uh I was working with another farm who had expressed interest in hemp and uh you know I was kind of doing research and development for it and I uh I ended up calling Lance about, you know seeing what, what we could do together on it. And, uh, you know, I really liked what he was doing here. It was uh, an interesting end of agriculture that I hadn't really gotten into yet. I'd always you know, kind of just been a basement grower and kept it to myself, but it was, uh, you know, a, a good opportunity to be able to do it on a larger scale and, um, you know, really be a part of an industry that's just, just now starting out as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah. Um, and it jumped at the opportunity and, that's how we got here. Very cool. So what's your background then? Sure. Uh, before this, I was working for a, a large scale wholesale nursery. Um, so it was tree and shrub production. I was the propagator there. So I was the one starting all the trees and the shrubs that would be eventually put out in the fields. Okay. Very cool. Now, Lance, um, welcome both of you, right? But Lance, now tell me how, what's your background besides, or share your background if you don't mind. I know a little bit about it, but sure, how'd you sure. get into this industry and what'd you do before this? Um, I started my career as an archaeologist um, and then went to law school and then uh, spent uh, about 22 years uh, in Manhattan as a, in and around Manhattan as a so first as a securities attorney and then as a, you know, as a, as a banker on uh, Wall Street. So uh, in about five or six years ago, I left that and began um, doing some smaller ventures in the food system. And so we were looking at building hydroponic systems, uh, running farmer markets, just just kind of doing things, that, interesting things that I enjoyed doing around some of the, the passions that I had. Uh, and we, we kind of uh, bumped into hemp and particularly CBD through our, our farmer's markets where those were being sold uh, in different consumer products. And I was fascinated by, I didn't know a whole lot about it, but did some research and then, you know, was ready when the farm bill passed in 2018 to, to launch a business that was focused on, you know, you know, being involved, you know, you know, more than in selling the retail product, but also in, you know, uh, growing genetics, cultivating, processing, and, and actually formulating some of those. So. Cool. So uh, tell me a little bit about where you guys are now, where you've been now, where are you, yeah. where are you at in business and where are you guys going? Sure. So we, we're actually, lo we're located in, in Illinois, the Northwest corner of Illinois. Um, and it, we, we came here pretty deliberately. Um, we decided that the Midwest was a, a very good place to be um, operating, you know, in the cannabis space. And, you know, you and I chat a little bit beforehand, but, you know, just to be clear to, to your listeners, this is more, we decided to speak more about uh, CBD hemp um, yep. as opposed to talking about THC today. We're talking about fiber. Uh, we'd love to get on and chat with you again about some of those other topics, but we're going to try and keep it focused on CBD and some of the minor cannabinoids today. Um, so we were looking at building out an operation initially that was focused on growing genetics um, for farmers. So, you know, ensuring that we, we selected the right strains for the region uh, that we were, we were you know, properly feminizing um, and, and creating enough, enough um, you know, variety that we could, we could offer, you know, some diversity of genetics to, to our customers. So we, you know, I originally started in New York. That's, that's where I, I came from. Um, yeah. Spent some time looking there. We were a grower and a processor in New York, but we, we ultimately decided the Midwest was the right place to be. Um, for various reasons, including um, just this is sort of the nation's center of agriculture. Um, the infrastructure here is built. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you know, manufacturing space that's available. Um, you know, there's a farming culture here. Uh, the cost of living is, is, is more affordable. So we decided this was the, the place to be. We spent a little time in Minnesota and North Dakota last year um, uh, doing some growing up there. We had some farming going on in New York. Uh, but ultimately looked at Illinois as a jurisdiction that seemed to fit well with our needs. So we, we came down into Illinois, found a, a facility that, that's uh, kind of around us here. You can see some of the some of it behind us here. Um, it's about 110,000 square feet. And we thought it would be great to start, uh, you know, initially growing genetics 
And then we've turned into more of an integrated firm where we're actually offering um, uh, processing services. We have an extraction capability here. We do uh, we have a formulation lab, we have a tissue culture lab. And, and so we have the ability to really to do everything within one roof, uh, growing our own genetics all the way through to formulating and distributing product. Incredible. How many acres did you grow last year and where? Um, so we partnered with a couple of different growers. Um, the group in Minnesota we were working with was growing 140 acres. Um, okay. The group in, in New York was growing five acres. Okay. So that's And this year, the same? Did you multiply yeah. where, where are not, you as well? Yeah. So we're not, we're not focused on being growers. We're not, you know, we actually built a cooperative uh, here yeah. in Illinois. We have 35 farmer members this year. So now I'll go here. Um, and it's been a fantastic experience because we've learned as much from them as they as, as they've learned from us. Um, but so for, for us, we're not we're not in the cultivation space. You know, that's not what we think we're best at. And since we have you know these partners in the cooperative, we get to work on cultivation through them. Um, and the partnership works well because our view on CBD, and I can, we can get more into the economics of this, but you know, our, our view on the CBD space after you know, the, the difficult we had in valuation and pricing last year is that there needs to be more attention paid to, to, to how to monetize your efforts, you know, in whatever value chain you're working in the space, you have to figure out how you're going to, to make a profit from what you've done. And, and we looked at selling genetics to farmers and we thought there wasn't a really great path to profitability for most, you know, because if you're selling your biomass and oil at current prices, it's challenging to, 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 to get any reward from your efforts. So the cooperative for us was a way of, of, of partnering with the farming community and, and helping them uh, find a, a way to, to monetize their efforts. So what we do is we provide genetics to members of the cooperative. Um, they cultivate, they harvest and dry and take back material here from their efforts. We process that. Um, we'll either, you know, focus on a portion of it will be packaged flour, a portion of it will be infused product. And then we go out and market those products, you know, to wholesale and retail buyers. And we share the, pro the, 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 the revenues at, at the level of the, of the sale of consumer products back to the farmer, not the sale of, of biomass and oil. And if, you know, for those who, who know, you know, much about the industry, most of the profitability takes place. Most of the, the returns generated um, on the sale of, of products to the consumer. Cool. So you guys take it all the way through. That's a that's a very that's a much more succinct way of saying it. Yes. <laughs> I guess it's <laughs> what are genetics. You know, you guys talk a lot about genetics and the value and the importance of genetics. Um, where do you see the biggest mistakes happening? You know, in the CBD space that people are making around the genetics conversation or lack of genetics. Uh, you know, this is a long enough conversation to go through all that, but you know, I, and we, we're, 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 we we make our own mistakes too, and we'll we'll follow. Oh, sure. Yeah, but um, uh, I think um, the 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 farming community is still ramping up and going up the learning curve in terms of what they should be looking for. Um, there are so many different variables to it; it's it's hard to really go into it. But you know, you have um, on the one hand, you have you know microclimates, different soil types, um, you know, uh, different farming practices that are going to, you know, sort of have a strong impact on the success or failure of a particular, you know, farmer's efforts. Um, from the pure genetics point of view, um, I think, you know, we've, we've looked at all the different ways of trying to do this. Um, so we have pretty strong views on what works and what doesn't. Um, I would say that um, those who, who think about using non-feminized genetics are probably uh, going to be challenged in in, in, a, in their farming year and and we'll probably end up doing feminized genetics the following year um, it's just the, the scouting process and the labor required is so intensive that um, most people some people try it but I, I think most people either either give it up or move to feminized um, you know so I think I think that's really important um, I think what, what else can I say about that um, feminized um, you know, whether you choose to, to use seed or seedlings or clones is also important. Um, it depends on your own infrastructure and your capabilities. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll ask John to kind of comment on that. We had farmers in our cooperative. We provided any 
you know, any of those, all three of those to them, most of the success I would say we've seen, um, the best success has come from the farmers using clones. Um, but that's not to say that seed and seedlings don't, don't also work well. It's just that it's uh, you're probably going to have to be a little bit more diligent and, and you know, attentive to the plants in the earlier stages for those to work out as well as clones. Definitely requires more experience when you're growing from seed. I have a much higher success rate of failure when I'm growing from seed uh, for anything, <laughs> let alone. Right. And I think that's something that people haven't necessarily considered as much because there's not many crops on a large scale that, that operate in that same way where you have the opportunity to start from your own. But the reality is if you start from a seed, you are taking an infant plant is, is what it is in practice and growing it into an adult. Um, the, the cutting is already a piece of that adult plant. So you tend to see you know, a higher resistance to pests, uh, you'll see a much higher tolerance for fertilizers and foods, um, you have a better tolerance for being able to accept, you know, water that may not be the best water in the world. So farmers who are using well water um, don't have as many hiccups. Um, overall, the, the, the clone from a physiological standpoint is a stronger piece of material than what you'll ever get out of a young seedling. Now, the, the seedling can grow up and it can be nice and strong and healthy, but like you mentioned before, the, the issue becomes it, it goes back to how much skill that particular grower has and their understanding of how to get it to where it needs to be um, is a much larger factor when you're working with a seed or a seedling. Cool. So I saw, I see on here that Matt and Ryan, I don't know if they can hear us or if we want to try to add them in. It looks like they've just called in potentially. Did you guys share a link? Let's see if we can get them. Matt, can you guys hear us, Ryan? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Hi. Hey, sorry about that. Good. Um, Ryan got caught up and so he'll be here shortly. Um, no worries. You're live. On. You're live on our live stream right now. Wonderful. All right. Okay. And Lance and John are both on as well. That's Hello. Great. Hey guys. So hey. for those, of those that are listening, sorry, sorry, Lance. Um, Want to introduce yourself real quick, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Matt Williams, we're here locally in Salt Lake City. Um, we work with Refined Wealth Management and have been working with Lance and, and his partnership with um, Solcana in the private equity. Um, I think that Ryan probably could be uh, more useful and in, in a more thorough introduction, but when he gets in, we can do that as well. Perfect, perfect. Well, we were just kind of talking about the CBD space and where, um, where it's going, or I guess where you guys have been uh, staying in the CBD space, where do you guys, John and Lance, really see the biggest opportunity and what are you guys working on, um, you know, that's up and coming or may not be out in the open and be talked about and maybe not you worked on, but what do you see, I guess, that's really being developed and um, maybe we should be watching for. Yeah, um, I, th I think you continue to see a proliferation of, of consumer products that are being developed and refined and we're, we're part of that effort you know we're doing our own in that space and you know I, I, I looking forward I think there are a couple of headwinds that we got to get through before you know we sort of see CBD products becoming more mainstream clearly you know this whole regulatory overhang is is difficult for the market um, we're not going to get to you know a large-scale adoption um, until the FDA has, has, has made some movement on, on what it's going to allow and not allow. Um, they've asserted ownership of, uh, of, of the regulation of CBD due to its inclusion as a, an active ingredient at the dialects. Um, uh, so I think, you know, you know, whether or not that's appropriate, whether it's, it's probably past the point of argue, um, the market accepts that the FDA is, 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 has oversight. And I think the industry is really waiting for them to, to kind of put you know some meat on the bones, if you will, around what uh, processors and formulators and distributors can and can't do, the kinds of claims that can be made. Um, and I think I don't think we're that far off as an industry from. I mean, we've for, kind of been forced to self-regulate in many respects, and I think yeah. that's a good thing in the sense that when you do that, um, you, know, you create a community 
of people who are all understanding that, you know, um, that the, their behavior has an impact on consumers, you know, perspectives on how safe or how useful products are. So, you know, I think what we're all dealing with are some bad actors in the space who have, you know, you know, done things that, you know, probably have been targeted at, at making a quick buck, but haven't been conducive to a, you know, longer term trust in the industry. Um, so I, th I think, you know, the headwind around the regulatory, um, you know, status of CBD and products is probably the, the biggest challenge that we're facing. I think, I think once we're past that, you're going to find large scale adoption by, you know, a large consumer goods companies. And I think at that point, um, you know, the opportunity is, is huge. Um, you know, I, I would say that one of the things that going back to the question before, but maybe a touch on this, one of the things that that I think caused the, the, the pricing problems last year was, and I, I don't think this is too much dispute, so I'm probably saying something that everyone understands, but there's a whole, you know, you know, oversupply. There's a huge overhang, right? And it continues to be here. Um, yeah. We're going to have probably quite a bit less hemp farmed this year. But until we have uh, the FDA come out and create more clarity in the market and you have large consumer goods products getting into the space, you know, that, that supply demand balance is going to probably be easily put out of equilibrium. So you're going to have a lot of volatility in pricing. Um, and so I think until that clears up, you know, where we want to be focused is on, you know, that, that, that point, uh, you know, in the value chain where we can monetize at the, the consumer product level. What, what are some of the cool products you're uh, making right now? I mean, outside of the common tinctures or, um, gummies, you know, some edibles. What are some cool things that you're you're developing? Um, so we have a skincare line um, that we think is very interesting. Um, our head of formulation here is a licensed uh, esthetician, and okay. he comes to us with a lot of years of experience in working in spas and you know um, you know other you know settings where you know that's that's something that people are accustomed to, to consuming. Um, so we've developed you know you know. Uh, facial serums, eye serums, uh, moisturizers, and other other applications that we think are going to be very interesting. And I think if you look at, and I don't have I don't have all the data at my fingertips, but I think what I've seen is is that um, that um, beauty market, if you will, has a lot of room to grow. I think there's a lot of space for that to grow. So um, that's very interesting to us. You know, we have the consumables, um, edibles, if you will. The we do have gummies. Everyone, everyone's got to have gummies. Um, we have vegan gummies as well, which are fantastic. Yep. Uh, we do uh, caramels, fruit chews. Our, 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 we have something called fruit chews and chocolate chews, which um, are based on white and, and, and milk chocolate um, that are that I think are very unique um, that I don't see other people doing. Okay. Um, we have tinctures. We have some pet products, um, uh, and then the you know typical topicals you see, which is you know, like the, uh, like a pain cream, um, cooling muscle gel, warming muscle gel. And then on the top, on top of that, we have all of our smokeable, smokeable products. So awesome. we offer, uh, you know, uh, pre-rolls and packaged flour and babes and stuff. And are you guys manufacturing, you're all in house, the whole piece of the manufacturing process once you, once you're getting the flour and the extraction? We do. I mean, you know, I'll just sort of pan our camera a little bit, see if I can do this like without kind of totally messing this up. So down to the other end of this of this floor here in our building, there we go. It's a little better. Is our formulation room, which you can't really see well from here, but um, that's um, that was that was something that we built earlier this year that now houses about a two thousand square foot formulation lab. Um, panning over here behind us is our extraction lab, where we where we extract biomass into um, into crude into distillate um so yeah we're we're fully we're, we're sort of fully integrated here we can do all this stuff you know in-house which is which for us is great because i think it, it it leads us to a place where we can actually uh offer some pretty attractive pricing um we don't, we're not dependent on um intermediaries or brokers for any point in the, in the supply chain well like you said it's where all the price gouging had happened right it's always at this farmers are being taken advantage of and it changes between the extraction and the distribution or the farmers and the extraction as to who's who's taking prices where and yeah um, and, 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 the yeah. and it's it's challenging because no we since we do we do all this internally here we, we understand 
each of these pieces fairly well. And, and you know, I, I realize why extractors need to price things the way they do. And it, it's, sure. it, I know that can seem like gouging to like farmers in some ways, um, or for example, distributors, you know, can, can, you know, sort of may seem like they're t- trying to take advantage, but, you know, putting these infrastructures in place is expensive. So I think it's, you know, we're still very early days. Um, I think, you know, fast forward a few years, a vertically integrated business may not be the right way to, to be running it. But I think today, given the uncertainty in the supply chain, it gives a business a lot more certainty around its ability to, to, to meet its plans. Well, and especially even even not only just the supply and the demand, but the consistency of the product, right? You know, as well as, as anybody in the industry that from one corner of the field to the next, you, you're your crop could potentially change, you know, the amount of CBD or the the level of THC in the genetics or in the plant. Um, and so, yeah, it's very difficult when you're trying to hit large scale orders and you're trying to pull from three or four different farms or three or four different labs and pull stuff together. The, the product demand is hard to meet. It, it's very yeah. up and down, up and down. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I you know, that testing comment you make that, that could suffice to, to fill a whole hour we'll leave that one alone but that's one of the challenges that we find is the inconsistency and, I, and there are there are groups there's a there's a group here in illinois that has developed a, um a project for the summer it's inclusive of university of illinois purdue michigan state and wisconsin madison and they've they've developed a project which i think is fantastic um, um it's being run mostly by a guy named Philip Alberti um, out here in Illinois with the extension that is, you know, essentially looking to um, create more, uh, create, create a, um, create more certainty around genetics and help farmers understand what's going to work for their field. And they're doing sure. all kinds of data gathering. Uh, and then at the end of the season, they'll come up with analysis on all the strains that were farmed throughout the Midwest and, and you know, have a body of knowledge next year for people to benefit from. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. I, I, I think you said it a couple of times and I just can't reiterate, you know, it's funny when people say, well, how come we don't have all of this stuff done? And why don't we have all of these regulations in place? And how come it's not just accessible everywhere? You have to remember we're in a very new industry and putting these things together, um, it takes a lot of time. You made a comment earlier or just a little bit ago that said, and you said that later on being fully integrated may not be the best choice but right now it is why why wouldn't it be later on what would be what would you see changing that would change that direction especially in cbd i can understand maybe in hemp fibers but consumables yeah i mean it's it's a comment that we've just sort of taken to heart here um as as an approach to trying to to be as nimble as possible from from a business strategy point of view so as an example, right, um, uh, a, a, call it a year and a half ago, uh, the market was pricing biomass at, you know, $4 per percent per pound. Fast forward six months from there, it was pricing at like 70 cents, right? So, I mean, show me a market where that kind of, you know, volatility doesn't completely disrupt supply, supply chains. Um, you know, so you had a, a, a bunch of people coming into the industry, uh, building out farming operations building out infrastructures for processing. So extractors and formulators. And, and when you have that kind of, you know, massive disruption in price, the, the, the follow on to that is tremendous. So if you're an extractor and you've priced in, you know, for example, let's say you priced in $5,000 crude per kilo, right? And now all of a sudden now it's, it's $800. You, you may not be in business anymore, right? You may not even be able to operate without losing money every day you walk into the office. So if you've set up a business that's in that environment where there's that kind of volatility that is um, that is integrated and allows you to monetize your efforts at different points in the chain, I can say I can still extract. I know I'm not making money on that extraction, but I'm not trying to. I'm trying to, to turn this product into a more refined product that allows me to sell into the retail channel where I still think I can make money. Sure. So I don't know if Ryan, if you're on, I'd love to hear from you. You're welcome to say hello. Otherwise, I want to kind of dig into your process. Like what makes your products a more superior product? Um, 
plants? Is it, you know, are you using water solubles? Are they, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the different types of product or the different type of carrier oil that's used. Um, you know, why should people use your products and what makes them a superior product? And I need some face products. So <laughs> send an order in. <laughs> fair package this afternoon for sure. Um, so two things I would mention, one is, uh, specific to our formulation process, but the other is more specific to the way we structure our business. Um, yeah. so on the formulation side, um, we, try, we try to stay as true to the plant as possible. Um, we use full spectrum wherever we can. Um, we, we made a determination a while back that um, it's very difficult to formulate edibles with full spectrum because there's a taste there that some, while some people appreciate it and want it, um, there's, there's an aspect of it that's not going to meet more of a mainstream uh, consumer demand. Mm -hmm. So we, on the, on the consumables or edible side, we are formulating with, with distillate. Um, and, you know, we've got, we've put a tremendous amount of effort into our formulation process, creating recipes and testing and making sure that the potencies and, and the taste and, you know, the natural ingredients are all coming together to create a product that people you know can appreciate that they enjoy enjoy consuming um so i think from our end it's just the experience that we have uh the diligence we put into it and you know just the thoughtfulness around how we've created it we're looking at adding new products every day um we'll be adding them as we go along and we've already got a couple of very unique consumable products i mentioned the 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 the, the, uh, the skincare line uh we'll continue to look for new ways to to, to, to innovate. We haven't gotten into the beverages, so um, we've looked at nano emulsion, we've looked at different ways of, of bringing an oil and the water together and making them stay, but we still don't think the technology is there to make that, um, make, it, make it work really well. And so we're, we're holding off on, on that part of it. The other piece of what I would say what makes us unique and, and why, why I think people you know, should, should appreciate you know, the products that we're producing is that we have, um, a chain of custody uh, from seed to all the way through to our formulated product in a package. Uh, we know where the product came from. I think my concern in looking at a lot of the products on the market is I don't understand where they come from. Like I, you know, I don't know what seed they were grown from. I don't know the farmer that grew them. I don't know the processor that extracted it. I don't know the formulator that, you know, you know, created it, packaged it. And in many cases, I think those four different roles can be played by four different people in different places. So I think the benefit for us, what we like about what we do is that we do it all here. I mean, we, we know we, we, we created the seed that the plant was grown from, that the oil was extracted from, that the formulated product was infused from, and it was packaged and delivered to our customers. It gives a sense of security to the consumer or the buyer. As a business, if I'm buying wholesale, right, and I'm looking for a product to distribute to my consumers or to my buyers, um, knowing that it's in-house is important to me or knowing that it's vertically integrated is important to me because I understand that, you know, there's a lot of uh, organizations that may take an acre from one farm and an acre two from another farm and one may not be organically grown and the other one is but then they put it in and extract it and now they're using in-house lab or their lab isn't really um, a certified lab and and then by the time it gets to the person that's making my product it may be a very repu reputable company but there's a lot of hands that have now touched it on the in-between and no real track and trace system that's universal. And so the idea of vertically integrated for consumables is very appealing for me as when I think about distribution and when I think about um, partnering, you know, with just the in-house operations, um, knowing that there's a solution and that I'm not gonna get to a spot where here I've grown product or I have product and now I've made it to the next phase and I'm stuck with another sum of product, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I think that's those are good points. And I, you know, for us, you know, layering on the cooperative, um, mm -hmm. for us just is meaningful because we like being able. First of all, we just like you know inherently being able to have those relationships. Those are satisfying to us. Um, I like I like working with um, people from different walks, and, and and I love working with farmers. Um, so to me, there's a there's an element of you know what we're trying to convey there is we're you know we know where these are being grown. 
John's heading out to one of our farmers uh, tomorrow to check on uh, some incidents of males. And, you know, he was out last week working with some folks who had some cutworm problems. And we're seeing some caterpillars at another farm, that, you know, and he's going out and troubleshooting all this stuff. These farmers yeah. are helping, helping participate in the solutions for that stuff. So incumbent on, you know, or as part of that, he's also seeing the development of the plants and he's helping ensure that, you know, you know, if someone had been thinking about maybe spraying some pesticide on it to talk to them about alternatives to that. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the end, what we think will, will happen is there will be a much higher quality crop that we'll be able to select from to be able to create the product from it. And I think, you know, from a, from a, a messaging story and conveying that, you know, to the market, you know, I think it's, it's going to be helpful in terms of, you know, creating a, um, you know, I guess a story around what we're doing and, and why it's meaningful. And we hope that it's going to resonate with, with the consumers. And how impactful it is that you're allowing, you know, and I say this all the time in Utah, Utah is not going to compare big scale to the Midwest. We're just not on growth, right? You guys are set up, like you said, your infrastructure, um, the, the amount of acres, the weather, there's a lot of change. A co-op is an ideal situation in Utah, in a lot of places, but specifically here where we have a lot of small farms, right? That now they can still participate in the in the opportunity and in the industry without drowning in the big masses, because as it comes on board and as hemp becomes more and more of a commodity, you move away from the opportunities to be competitive in cost if you're trying to do everything on your own, right? And so I'm really, yeah, I'm really attracted to the idea of the co-op and and like you said, not just to the benefit of you, but to the benefit of everybody. You know, everybody's learning pieces. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we, our, our eventual goal is to expand that co-op. We're in, we're in two states now. Um, we'd love, we'd love to expand that concept, you know, throughout the Midwest and and beyond that as well. Um, so that's 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 one of the things we think would be valuable. We think it's doable, and we, we also think it creates good scale. You know, oh. you want to scale the business where where it makes sense to scale it, and you don't want to scale it where it doesn't make sense. And I don't think it makes sense to scale CBD hemp in the cultivation stage. You know, you need to have that be um, a craft grow. It's, you know, when, when you start to me mechanize the production of this plant, you lose a lot, you know, whether it's in the cultivation stage or whether it's in the, the harvest or the drying stage, the more touches on this plant, the lower quality it's gonna be. Um, trichomes reside on the outside of the plant. They are not going to stay there if you're bumping it around, throwing it through a combine, silaging it, drying it under, you know, sort of, you know, intense heat. So, you know, it's, it's not, I, I don't think that C, now we can talk about fiber another time. I don't think CBDM is scalable as a, as a farming practice. I don't think it's going to become a large commodity crop. I think it's going to be a specialty crop. Um, I think it will be something that retains a very high premium, but then post cultivation there's the opportunity to scale and that's what we think we can do in partnership with farmers is help scale that post-harvest process to develop really high quality product. okay so i have a question I've, I've read a lot and i'm not an expert in this so fill me in but um where the dea has come in to total thc including delta eight and um where you see uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit where the FDA has kind of put put some or we're waiting on regulations to come out from the FDA because CBD is now uh, in a uh, medication, not a vitamin, right, in a prescription um, for an epidiolect. Where do you see CBD going and this market going? Um, give me some feedback. There's a lot of conversation that the worry that it's going to be cornered into the market with cannabis and distributed under big pharma compared to um, a nutraceutical or a vitamin. And, you know, where do you see that split? I, I feel like the industry on the farm bill is divided into two pieces, cannabis and industrial hemp. And I feel like there's almost three pieces, industrial fiber, uh, hemp, which is what you guys, you know, hemp, CBD, topicals, consumables, and then medical. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts as far as where you see this going, being in the CBD and extraction? Um, I, I think uh, I, I think we're seeing it just organically grow. Um, I don't I don't think necessarily there are major changes to the structure of the market. 
Um, I, I think the market's already kind of found, you know, you know, I mean, it'll continue to expand in terms of, of scale and quantity um, and, and certain types of product as, you know, people become more technically proficient in making them. Um, but I, I think we're just operating under a chill right now. And, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's kind of a, it's, it's an interesting place to be because you're going back to your, your, your DEA comment, um, you know, processors right now are in a bit of a bind because, you know, you know, the, the, the recent DEA release, I think it was on the 25th. Um, I think what they said is, you know, yes, we agree. And we're, we're on board that, uh, CBD is a compound is not schedule one. But, you know, anything, de not everything derived from hemp is not schedule one. Um, right. So if you take and you artificially or, or, or synthetically derive a THC product from, say, a, a Delta 8 or something else, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in violations of, of, you know, schedule one. And, you know, I think the other part of this the processors are particularly worried about is, you know, um, you know, so when when you take biomass and you convert it into oil, what you're doing essentially is you're you're concentrating um, the the quantity of, of the, these compounds into you know a, you know a more liquidized version. So, you know, you take a plant that's got say 15% CBD and well, we're not going to get there. On Let's say it's 10% CBD, 0.3 THC, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you convert that into a 70% CBD. Right. Well, you know, you know, you've multiplied the CBD from the biomass to the oil by seven times. You know, you're going to multiply the THC the by seven times. So you're over two percent on THC once you have that oil invariably. And, and I think the problem is that, you know, under the technical guidance from DEA, you know, that processor is theoretically, you know, in possession of um, a controlled substance. And, you know, so I think this has put a, a huge chill on the processing market. Um, and, you know, until that gets resolved one way or another, um, you know, it's just created a lot more business risk for people trying to operate in the space. It's a lot of gray. And this is where I get nervous. You know, when we talk about new companies coming in, and I'm sure Matt and Ryan can relate to this, when this gray area is, is out there, um, what are the effects of new money coming in when we want to build up the infrastructure? Um, you know, when the risk comes back to at any point federally, um, rules can change or you can be criminally charged now for processing a, you know, the same way you've been doing business um, and understanding that your final product and this start product was less than 0.3. But in that process, there's that gray area that's, pretty risky. And yeah, I just, I hear a lot of, that's the concern is as it's already hard to raise money in this industry because of the risk and the banking and the, yeah. the challenges. But then you add, you know, this big gray area where, like you said, the industry's still up and running. And I don't know if this is accurate or not. I'll put this out there, but I almost feel like this, this year and all of our problems or challenges we've been faced with have almost made it a an opportunity for this industry to gain hold and grow without you know it, it there wasn't a lot of attention put on this industry to change a lot of rules and so as there wasn't the industry continued to grow and develop um at you know versus everything being focused on yeah. the capital and hemp space yeah, I, I, so I, <clears throat> my background is in a highly regulated space, the banking industry, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's been, uh, it's been an interesting juxtaposition to be in this space where there's not a whole lot of, you know, you know, concrete guidance around, you know, what, what's, what's right, what's, what's not right. Uh, the rules are unclear. There, there are just not rules in certain places where there should be, um, you know. So, but I think this is probably endemic to new, to new growth industries, right? You're really kind of making up a lot of the stuff as you go along and you're trying to you're trying to be as, as compliant, uh, you know, you know, yeah. as you possibly can. And a lot of it is just using common sense, um, trying to be, you know, trying to be, uh, you know, ethical about the decisions you make. Um, and I think I th I'm seeing change. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the, the, the players in this industry come out of the, the, the marijuana space and, you know, I think that's got its own unique challenges in terms of, you know, 
it having been, you know, essentially a black market industry for so long. And I think that breeds a certain kind of attitude and personality in the participants. Mm-hmm. And so I think what I'm seeing now, though, is, a, is, 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 is you know, sort of, um, I would say, a transformation, you know, of the people who are voicing participating uh, to being, you know, less, uh, I would say, uh, proprietary and secretive about what they do, but being more cooperative and focused on trying to, you know, sort of build things forward and thinking about, you know, two steps ahead and not not just how much money am I going to make this year by selling people a bunch of bunk seed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we've interviewed quite a few people that say, you know, it's funny as they've been in this industry for quite a while running a real business. You can tell when your clients or other buyers start running a real business and they either hire an accountant or their bank accounts get set up and their money finally starts to get picked up and paid on time. And it really is. I think that you're starting to see people, one, that haven't been in the industry come into the industry and people that have been in the industry um, now have resources and tools to be able to run a legitimate business, you know, even down to simple um, like quick QuickBooks or different, different accounting softwares that were open and available to everybody that weren't open to anybody in the cannabis space. Yeah. And so now, you know, it's really just started to open up. There's definitely been a shift. Um, before we hang up, Ryan and Matt, are you guys on? I'd love to hear from you guys and kind of get your perspective on the the business. Mandy, can you hear me? I can. How okay, are you? Yeah, sorry, um, we're having some difficulty with video, so. That's okay. Um, thanks for having I- us. Yeah. I suckered I suckered Lance in. He didn't have an option. I told him we didn't have a choice, and then you guys ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you guys? We're great. I don't know how much Matt uh, gave on introduction, but uh, you know we're here locally with you guys in Salt Lake, and, and I'm assuming most of your members, Mandy, are kind of in the uh, along the Wasatch Front here. Is it pretty much all over the uh, the state? Um. Our face-to-face events and stuff have been obviously mostly in Utah, but our listeners and members of AHA are all over the nation and globe. Very good. Right? Yeah. Um, go ahead. I'd hear. To, I'd love to hear Matt give us a little bit of an overview about who you were, and then said, and when Ryan gets on, he'll give a better intro. <laughs> yes. I, can you repeat that? It was it was breaking up. What'd you say? I apologize. He's he said that. Matt gave a little bit of an intro and then said, when you get on, he would let you give the real intro. You bet. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of jumped in here late, so I don't know how far you guys got with things. But, um, you know, Lance and I, uh, well, we kind of started a partner a few years ago, uh, you know, in, the, in a private equity opportunity where we're, we're exploring the, the different uh, places to go with it. and where the opportunities might exist. And and um, it was interesting at the time that we had a number of our clients that uh, were approaching us about uh, investment in some kind of a marijuana, you know, play. And, you know, as we were researching, you know, different opportunities within, you know, public markets, we, we were realizing just the, the, the level of premium that investors were paying to, to, to play. And, 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 it, and, and for me, it was, you know, stepping back from this and, and, and analyzing, you know, is, is this really an opportunity for us in, in maybe a private equity position to go after something and bring our investors into a ground floor investment? And, and really, that was kind of the, the, the start of, of our, uh, our, you know, relationship and our build on the private equity. Uh, Lance having you know, a number of years experience in private equity. I'm on the other side, you know, as a registered investment advisor here in Utah. We cover a number of states. Um, but, you know, as we as we've been working through this, uh, you know, Lance was doing a lot of the uh, the groundwork and, and, and where to go and how to position, uh, you know, us into a, an investment like this. So the last, you know, the last few years have been been quite a grind definitely it's 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 funny when i hear people say um, oh i'm gonna hurry up and dump my retirement or sell my home i'm gonna grow hemp because that's the gold rush or the green rush and it's much more labor intensive and it's been a lot of ups and downs 
it is and i and i think it's a patience game too you know we, we we're very we're very uh you know uh, mindful of due diligence and and just how much uh time uh you know we will take in in, in making these investments so uh you know we, we have a we have a really strong uh, fiduciary duty to our investors and so you know we're we're pretty engaged on the oversight of the fund and, and uh, our ownership in this this operation and, and how we're you know moving this thing forward. So what are some things, um, I guess, to all of you that we can do as an association to really help you guys as a business move things forward? Well, you know, I think that for us, it's just, with, I guess with any business, right, it's 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 marketing and, and just getting your name out there and, and uh, letting people know what you do and 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 if there's you know services that you know people need I, I don't know how far you guys got into any of the services that Solcana provides I uh, maybe more on the white labeling side or, or anything like that but I'm sure that's something that you know can be for another conversation yeah we yeah we talked a little bit about that I think um, you know what what you're doing man is valuable bringing, bringing people together um, I think there's still you know sort of um, a lot of a lot of separation and distance between participants in the industry, and that'll change over time. And I think efforts like the one you're making are, you know, are imperative, you know, to make that happen. So I thank you for that. Yeah, I I love this. I it's funny when people say, well, what? Well, even with you, Lance, we were talking. We said, well, what are we going to talk about? There's so much to talk about and so much to touch on. It's hard. Um, my favorite part, though, is I feel like I shove it down people's throats so much it's nice hearing the same thing from someone else you know that it's just refreshing to know that i'm not like the lorax on dr seuss but i really do speak for the trees and i really am passionate about what's happening and so it's nice working with people like you guys that are doing it right and it's more than just the money grab right we're all in it because there's an opportunity but it really is a long-term a long-term play and a lot of opportunity to help a lot of different people um I just saw here that Justin had a really good question. Do you see any Reg D um, accredited diff, uh, investors offerings in the cannabis space gaining traction? Um, and I would assume Ryan. Yeah. I don't know if you well, can answer that. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let Ryan talk about it too. But uh, you know, I think well, that's exactly what we did when we raised capital for this. Actually, we used the Reg D offering to uh, to do that. Um, so I think you know. Absolutely. Those opportunities exist. I think probably um, not as many as, as, as I think many people would like to be able to have access to because it's typically much more private and, you know, they aren't advertised. You know, they're, they're unsolicited offerings. So, um, but they're out there. Yeah. Brian, do you want to say anything about it? Yeah. You know, that's exactly what we did, right? Was was uh, moved through Reg D offering to accredited investors uh, within our, our base. Um, I think you know, it's tough, right? Because if you're not accredited, it's it's just more difficult to to get into this space. Uh, but there, I think in in the near term, there's going to be opportunities for these non-accredited investors to to be jumping into the space. Uh, we were Lance and I were talking about just you know how do we at some point start to you know maybe liquidate or uh, liquefy our the the operation, and there's certain ways to do that. Um, and, and that would be at, at a point where there are, you know, non-accredited investors that are able to to get into that opportunity. So um, we're seeing it. We're seeing more and more of it uh, in in, the, in that space. Uh, you know, and I think with the slowdown in in the hemp and and uh, you know pricing and everything, that it, it uh, has slowed down investment to a certain point. But I think that does change over time, and I think things start to uh you know move back into the space well well i hear a lot of times you know say like first money's been in now new money's coming in and so i i do envision opportunities open up just like just like when it comes to well i'll be at networking events or different meetings and i'll look over and i'll say oh wait you were in him i had no idea but i mean people new and new business people are starting to come in from all different verticals yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the white label service that you guys have? Um, tell me a little bit about how what that looks like and how do people get in touch with you guys if they want have questions or or want to get involved, or have questions about the co-op? Yeah, so our, our white label business kind of 
organically grew out of the cooperative business we're running. It, you know, we, okay. we're, we're trying, you know, this is our, our first season with the cooperative. Um, and, and the way it operates is, um, you know, farmers, you know, post season bring material to us and we, we process it through and refine it into final product. Um, a lot of the farmers we have in the cooperative grew last year. And so we've been extracting their material along, you know, as we've been talking to them about the cooperative and growing this year. And, you know, once they've gotten to the point of, of, of having converted their biomass to oil, you know, the question invariably comes up, well, what do I do with my oil now? And, right. and so we set up a program to say, look, it's, 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 it, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if you were able to take your own, you know, your own oil that you grew and take it to your local market in the form of, of a, of a edible or a topical or a smokable and actually, you know, market it yourself, you know, and like sort of a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a full, you know, sort of chain of custody that you have, you know, where this came from, you grew it, you know, and I think it's a really powerful thing. And, and a lot of the farmers who um, have been increasingly taking us up on this have had great success, even if it's just going to farmer's markets or on farm market or going to a local drugstore or a grocery store. Um, we're seeing a lot of good traction with it. So I think for us, the white label business has been one where we've sort of organically grown it out of what we're doing. And we see that it's actually a, a full fledged, interesting business in and of itself. So we encourage anyone who, who would like to take advantage of that service. We can actually extract their biomass and turn it into to product and let them track it back to their own field. Um, and, you know, if you, if you wanted to reach out to us to have a chat, you can reach me at Lance at Sulcana.com. That's S-U-L-C-A-N-N-A. Dot com, right? Dot com. Yeah. Perfect. I just shared it on all of our, our feeds. Um, I, I was looking on your page in, if a, somebody that doesn't have farm property wants to get involved in the co-op, do you guys have property that they can? I saw on, on your page, is it like a, depends on which level, um, say, say I do a $5,000 or $5,500 membership that gets me so many seeds and so many acres that will eventually turn into so many liters or so many pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have, we've structured this pretty flexibly. A, co a cooperative is one that's, you know, it's a single member, single vote cooperative. So it's a true cooperative in the agricultural sense. Um, and it, it's, all, it's, it's com comprised solely of producers. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're not inviting, you know, marketers or, you know, it's, it's about farmers working with farmers to produce product. Um, you know, there are some of the farmers who have joined exclusively really just to get access to white label. Um, or to, or to, you know, sort of be a part of, of the other services we're marketing, which is fine. Um, you know, but we're, we're asking that anyone who's involved here is actually looking to, to be a producer, whether it be a quarter acre or even smaller or up to, to 10 to 15 acres. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're working with, with groups all within, uh, within those ranges of, of size of acreage. Well, I love it. And I love that it really is wherever you can step in or need to step in, you have the solution. I think that there's a lot of pieces that have been put together. Even we saw this in the association, right? There's a lot of associations out there. A lot of them are either, um, you know, based on product being produced like a CBD or a, a construction material, or they're regionally structured. Um, there's really not an all inclusive and something like what you guys have done is really a, like I said, that seed to shelf supply chain and a solution for, any size business, you know? Yeah. And, and, I, and I think um, we're, we're talking our book a lot today, so I apologize for that. But I, I think, yeah. you know, when you, when you think about, when you think about what, you know, you know, for someone who's looking to be involved in the industry, you know, there, there are lots of different ways. It doesn't have to be all vertical. So, you know, I think, you know, but I, I think the risk for us and the reason we've done it the way we've done it is because we just didn't want to get too exposed to any one, you know, part of the value chain. Um, I think they're obviously, you know, we're capitalized well so that we can do that. Um, um, you know, and I, I would love to, to, to talk more in more detail. We could go into any one of these verticals and spend a whole, you know, day talking about each one of them. And I'd be happy to do that. Anyone yeah. interested in reaching out just to have the conversation, share our experience and our knowledge, you know, uh, what we've learned. Well, I think that that's what I'm the most passionate about or have learned. And people ask me all the time, you know, when I start talking about the capabilities of an association or of, of the industry, 
no other plant has fits into every single little space. And so it's hard sometimes for me to narrow in, well, what are we going to talk about today? Or what is it that I'm, that my ask is, or that I'm focused on? And I think for me personally, it's, it's educating and giving people an, a platform or an opportunity. You know, we're creating this big database of searchable content where anybody at any point can get on and say, hey, I'm curious about genetics and anything we've spoken about can pull up and be a resource, right, for people, as well as a platform on the back end so that you being in the space or interested in getting into the space, you you know have a resource of who to talk to and, wh and what's out there and who's doing what right. Um, and so that's really what's been the most fascinating to me. So I would love to have you back on and I would love to talk about each of these verticals. I'd love to talk more about the, the endocannabinoid system or the cannabinoids and how they're working, what you're seeing specifically. Um, I don't know if you real quick want to touch on what are some of the cannabinoids that you're focusing on or that you're seeing becoming popular? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this year was the, was the explosion of CBG. Um, yeah. you know, and so we've, we've, we've got, so we've got a test plot outside our, our, our facility here with about 40 different strains, uh, that we're growing, um, you know, and, and testing and understanding, doing R and D on, uh, we have three different CBG varieties that, that we're working on now. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of talk about, uh, other can minor cannabinoids that, that, that people are looking to try and isolate, uh, and express in, 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 in the plant form. Um, our experience so far with CBG is that um, it's if, if CBD is in, in its infancy, CBG hasn't even been born. It hasn't even been born yet. I mean, it's it's you know the plants the structures we're seeing and the consistency uh, among different phenotypes is is challenging, and I'm sure a lot of people who are listening probably you know have had experience with it would echo that. So we're we're many years away from 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 getting further down that road. I think CBC. I'm hearing and people are trying to isolate. Sure. Um, CBN is something that is just becoming increasingly interesting to people. Um, so we'll see that and we'll see an, 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 you know proliferation of, of product that's built around those. Um, you see it now in shops, you, you know, see CBG focused products. Um, so I think it's fantastic. I mean, and all these different cannabinoids have different properties that are that, that affect that endocannabinoid system differently. So um, sure. but, but going back, I think for me, I still believe in in, in the full step full spectrum approach. Um, I think, I think the farther away we get, it's why we haven't really gotten involved in isolates because you know, you're, you're, you're turning, you know, something that has, you know, I, I think just is a, a raw material, great value to the human system, you know, and you're, and you're picking and choosing pieces of it to use. And I don't, I don't think we know enough yet to know, you know, what benefits we're giving up and at what costs. Well, you said earlier, the less less times we touch it, right, or the more times we're touching it, the further away we're getting away from the value. And I think that that's just it. And we've it's almost like we're dissecting it to put it back together. It's like we had to take it apart to prove that what was already there was the, the best way. Yeah. And I think that happens a lot because, you know, people's mm -hmm. formulation practices, they're trying to figure out how to, how to create this, this product that has... You know exactly what they want to have in it and, and our, our approach has been more just let's just not muck around too much with <laughs> with the compound yeah. you know or the compounds and their and their and the composition of them let's use them as they, they get pulled from the plant and and create products that way and I, th yeah. I, th I think as science moves on and its sophistication and more study is done we'll have a better idea how to do that um more responsibly uh, sure. but, but so far i think it's you know our approach just in it's our opinion right really is all it is is that the more we the more we leave it alone the better off we are sure sure well john i'd love to have you back on sometime also and talk about what i know the least about and it is on the farm um yeah. i'd love to even see sometime i'd love yeah any any time i'd love to have you on if you're ever out in the field or um just want to chat i'd love to speak about the seeds to cultivation and what that process looks like um yeah. Any tips? I'm very, like I said, I'm very uneducated about that piece. I have a lot of people very interested and I'm firmly believe that that is the most valuable piece of this whole puzzle because without it, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> so yeah, I would love to share. I'd love yeah. to talk. I mean, anytime um, that you, you want us to jump on, we can go ahead and do that and kind of run you through really any of the aspects of growing it. Um, you know, in the meantime, if anyone's kind of curious about, you know, 
the small window into what we do, you guys can look at us at uh, facebook.com slash Sulcana Hemp. Um, and that'll give you just a couple pictures of things like our flower rooms, plants out in the field, um, you know, and it's it's another good spot if you do just have brief questions to to reach out and ask those. Um, but again, as far as, as us coming on and talking about the growing end of it, we'd be happy to do that anytime you'd like us. Yeah, I would love it. Um, it. In fact, sooner than later, I'm kind of gonna formalize. I'm not kind of, I am going to formalize these a little bit. We're gonna start doing some commercials and break them up. I've got a lot of interest and we're growing pretty quickly, getting some good traction. And so um, as nervous as it makes me, I mean, even just coming on here, it was a stretch for me. I had never even hosted a Zoom before COVID and the pandemic. And so now I'm on every single day interviewing people, but I'm just ready to take it to a new level and really grow. And um, with that, I'll formalize it a little bit and we'll have some more structured conversations, but I'd love your feedback and I'd love to involve you guys in that as much as possible. Um, and John, just from a, <laughs> a face farmer, good. do you have any good uh, hemp beard oil suggestions? I don't. I, uh, I haven't delved into that, uh, that end of it yet, but as soon as I do, I'll let you know. We have, that's in our product development. Yeah, we're, we're going to get there. Okay, I was going to say that may be one that we're not talking about that's coming. <laughs> It'll be on the list. That would be awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I really enjoyed having you. Um, I'll send over invites for our upcoming of events. I did share your contact information, Lance. Um, and then, John, Lance, if you can connect John and I and Ryan, I hope to see you on Thursday. Matt, you're welcome to join us as well. I don't know if yeah. you'll be there at the trap shoot. Yeah, we, yeah. Plan, we plan to both be there, so we'll, we'll uh, look forward to that. Excellent. I'm sorry. We'll have to come out your way, Lance, and do something. Yeah, for you. Uh, we're welcome well. to visit for sure. Keep up the good work, man. It's just, this is good stuff. Though. Well, thank you very much. You guys have a good day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.